Hello and a warm welcome back to the Oxfordian Frontline. If you are new here, you are probably asking yourself, what did Sir John Suckling know? If, however, you are familiar with this channel, you will be aware that there are many presentations on it already with similar titles, So and So New, in each of which I take a late 16th or early 17th century witness and show how we know that he knew that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym used by Edward de Vere, the poetical playwriting Earl of Oxford. If you haven't seen some or any of these programmes, please check them out, for not only is contemporary corroboration a very important factor in settling the matter of Shakespearean authorship, but it is, I think, enormous fun, marvelling at the inventiveness and ingenious variety of device that these people used to convey to posterity a fact that was evidently censored by authority. So who then was Sir John Suckling? Well, if you look at the border of this picture, you can pretty well work it out. You can see in the top left-hand corner a sword showing that he was a soldier, which is crossed with a quill on top of a bay laurel wreath showing that he was a poet, and in the top right what looks like a theatre curtain, so yes, he was a dramatist, a playwright. In the bottom left you can see a coat of arms showing that he was a gentleman, and bottom right you see an open visor on a helmet. The open visor in heraldry is a symbol that he was a knight as opposed to an earl or a duke or anything like that. He was considered one of the greatest wits of court. He was said to be the inventor of the game of cribbage. He was also a great gambler, something of a womanizer, and a very clever man who was something of a mystic. He loved, certainly loved to uh, play about with ciphers, and he considered himself to be apart from those who weren't clever enough to keep up with him. Since the world is full of profane eyes, he wrote, the best way sure is to keep all mysteries from them. We see here a collection of his poems published after his death, in which we hear that his wit uh, did inspire the thespian scene and Delphic lyre. The thespian scene is an allusion there to Thespis, who was the father of Greek tragedy, and the Delphic lyre is an allusion to Apollo, if he did inspire the Delphic lyre, he inspired Apollo to, to respond to his wit at Delphi. Delphi being where the oracle of Apollo was. In those ancient Greek times, people went to the oracle of Apollo to ask how they might align themselves with their destiny. And if they were lucky, Apollo responded, usually in a very gnomic way, which was extremely difficult to understand. Now, what I want to look at today is this beautiful masterpiece by Anthony van Dyck, commissioned by Sir John Suckling, we think about 1638 or so. One of the things you'll notice immediately about it is that he is holding this huge, great, big book. This is the great folio of Shakespeare's plays, 36 of them first published in 1623, often known as the first folio, and clearly he's holding it because he is a huge admirer of Shakespeare. In fact, his tragedies have been shown to be very much influenced by Shakespeare. Another little thing you might notice is a bit of Latin writing down there, mystical Latin writing. I will, of course, come back to both the writing and the book. But right for now, I'd like to look at aspects of this picture that often get overlooked. First notice the expression on his face, one of rapt attention, as though he is looking at or listening to something that is just off the scene of the viewer of this picture. We can't quite see what it is, but he seems to be enthralled to it. Secondly, look at his costume. This is not the garb of a 17th century courtier. This is not the garb of a 17th century soldier. He is wearing ancient Greek costume, Arcadian costume. Some critics have suggested that he is wearing a costume designed by his friend Inigo Jones, who was the grandmaster of the English Freemasons, who was also a designer of stage costumes for court masks. Uh, that is certainly a possibility, but there's more to it than just saying, Van Dyke, paint me in some Greek costumes because I'll look nice in it and I like masks. I'd like to draw your attention also to the bay laurel that is just over there to his right. The bay laurel, of course, very much associated with Apollo, Laurus Nobilis, as it is known. Apollo, who turned Daphne into a bay laurel bush and wore forever 
a wreath of bay laurel which he passed off to poets and musicians to honour them. I'd like you to notice also this rock. I know I'm entering into a dangerous territory here, the world of pareidolia, that seeing things, seeing shapes, seeing faces, whatever, and things like clouds, curtains, rocks. But if you look very carefully at this rock, you will see a large face. You might not, but you might see it. If you can't see it, don't worry about it. Let's have a look a bit closer at the rock. You Actually, some of you will be able to notice all sorts of little imps with well-drawn eyes, some of them looking a bit like the skeletons, a bit like ghouls, the sort of spirits. Don't worry if you can't see these. I would strongly advise, if you're anywhere in the vicinity of New York after the lockdown, that you go to the Frick Museum where this marvellous painting is held and look closely there. What I've just rung there is a really well-painted little eye. If you can't see it, it belongs to a, a bigger face that is there. And as I say, there are plenty more of these, but uh, I don't want to get people hung up if they think they can't see them in the way I'm circling them now. I have no doubt that others will see even more than I can see. And it's really worth going to the Frick Museum website where you can bring up this painting and look at it in great detail and have fun yourselves looking at what I believe are a masterfully painted series of faces, spirits, eyes, teeth, showing that this rock is essentially possessed. Now, I think if you take all of these characteristics that we've just looked at together, namely the expression of rapt attention, the Arcadian costume, the Apollonian bay laurel, the rock that is possessed of spirits, and the mystical message on the side, we can actually piece it together to work out what is going on in this painting. It strikes me that what Sir John Suckling did is he said, Dear Van Dyke, please can you paint me as though I were at the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi. Therefore, that, that rock possessed is what Sophocles, I think, describes as the Oracle speaking rock at Delphi. Or maybe his rapt attention is, is just beyond it at some prophetess at the Sibylline rock at Delphi. Now Delphi of course is the oracle of Apollo and that's where the ancient Greeks went to ask Apollo questions or the noble Greeks went to ask how do I align myself to my destiny and Apollo didn't always answer in a way that was easy to understand. As Heraclitus says, Apollo whose oracle is at Delphi neither reveals nor conceals but gives a sign very much as Van Dyck has painted all those hidden ghoulish faces in that rock, but also in the sign that Apollo appears to have given, which is written, apparently written on the rock. If we look at it closely, it's not exactly carved in. Van Dyke could easily have done it so it looked as if it was carved. It's almost as though it's hovering over it, as though it is an echo, if you like, of Apollo's message or answer to Sir John Suckling. It says, ne te quaesiveris extra, which is normally translated as seek not outside yourself. In other words, don't be influenced by other people, have your own thoughts, be your own man, know yourself. In fact, know yourself was another message that was up on the temple of Apollo at Delphi. This phrase has been taken from Perseus Satires 1.7, which in broader context reads, when foggy-headed Romans disparage anything, don't step in to correct their false balance, nor look to anyone outside yourself. In fact, uh, Perseus says, nec te quaesiveris extra, not ne te. And we'll see shortly why this has been changed to ne te. But the point that's being made by Perseus is the same. In, in other words, don't pay attention to anybody else's opinion, just think within yourself. That's the meaning of it. Now, this brings up an immediate problem, because if you remember the picture, Sir John Suckling is holding an enormous book of Shakespeare, clearly saying that he absolutely loves Shakespeare, and as we know, he is very, very influenced by Shakespeare. So how does this make sense? How could Suckling have gone to Anthony Van Dyke and said, oh, could you paint me with an enormous book of Shakespeare, which I absolutely love, and a message by it saying, do not be influenced by anyone except yourself? This is a huge contradiction. In other words, don't be influenced by Shakespeare. Is it likely that he said to Van Dyke, can you draw a picture with, with Apollo's oracle telling me to throw away my wonderful precious book of Shakespeare? 
I don't think so. The message seems to be coming out of this picture that don't be influenced by anyone except Shakespeare. But as we have already seen, Apollo talks in riddles, and it was always the duty of the Greeks who went to the oracle at Delphi to take away what Apollo had said and chew upon it and think about it and try to get to the real message at the bottom, and that is exactly what we are going to do now. Now, the best way to understand what Apollo is actually saying here is, of course, to appeal to Apollo himself and say, what are you saying? How do you appeal to Apollo? Well, many of you will have seen a presentation I've put online already, which is called Francis Mears New, in which I talk about the Io Iopian, as it is known, the call to Apollo, which is Io Io. You say it twice like that, and Apollo might, if you're lucky, come and help. Well, the Io Iopian, as you can see the way it's written there, looks very like 10 10. And in fact, this association goes right back to the ancient Greeks, whose numeral for 10 was the iota. So the io io has long been seen by people fascinated by numerology as an equivalent of 10 10. So we're going to appeal to Apollo using the io io pian as 10 10, i.e. we're going to split that little phrase into two equal parts of 10 letters each. Now, perhaps you might begin to understand why Perseus's neck was not wanted. Instead, it was nete, uh, in order to ensure that you do, in fact, get ten letters on each side. So let's translate this and see if we have an improved meaning. Ne, te, well, ne is a sort of article of negation, and uh, te is, of course, the ablative form of you, i.e. in you, so not in you, or as in English you might say, it is not in you. Quasi, I can see a lot of you Latin experts at the back of the class saying, yes, that must be the passive infinitive of quiry, but you would be slightly wrong. Quasi is actually the passive infinitive of uh, quaiso, which is uh, to entreat. So you would have, it is not in you to be entreated. Uh, various extra, well, extra means outside of, as we've already seen, and veris is the genitive of vir, which means spring, but of course you can all see where this is going. It's also the genitive of the name vir. Extra can take either the genitive or accusative forms and can be placed either after or before the word which it describes. So here, veris extra can be translated as outside of vir. Well, this is a rather literal, perhaps rather heavy-handed translation. It is not in you to be entreated outside of Veer, but we can see what it basically means. We now have two, not one, but two messages from ne te quaesiveris extra. The first then being, seek not outside yourself. And then by using the io iopian, uh, we have the second phrase, it is not in you to be entreated except of vir. Entreated, of course, means asked to do something, persuaded, swayed, uh, beguiled is one uh, definition in the Oxford English Dictionary. If I were putting this into absolute plain, obvious English, I would say, seek not outside yourself, it is not within you to be influenced except by vir. So we were right then. This painting is saying that uh, Sir John Sutcliffe can be influenced only by Shakespeare. So he's asked Apollo, how do I align myself with my destiny? And he gets the answer, do not be influenced by anyone except Veer, meaning Shakespeare, quite obviously. If we look at the book carefully, we can see it says Hamlet up on the right-hand recto page there. And on the tab sticking out of the side of the book, we have Shakespeare. I'm sorry it's not very easy to read, but believe me, that's what those two things say. So I think what seems to be happening is he has marked out the hundred or so pages of Hamlet in the first folio. Hamlet, I suspect, because Hamlet, as all Oxfordians know, is the most autobiographical of Shakespeare's plays, and you find... Um, the Earl of Oxford's father-in-law, Lord Burley, who's lampooned as Polonius. We find Hamlet himself uh, training people to read poems and do plays, just as Edward de Vere did. Uh, we find him being stripped naked by pirates, just as happened to Edward de Vere. We find him uh, reading 
the famous book of Cardanus Comfort, which was Edward de Vere's favourite book, etc., etc., etc. I think even George Chapman at the at the time seemed to know that Hamlet was the autobiography of Edward de Vere. Now, there's something quite interesting about this, which I'd like you to notice. Wouldn't it have been a bit easier, I thought, for Van Dyck to have written Hamlet on the left-hand page there, on what we call the verso page, instead of where he actually put it. And the most curious thing about this is that if you go to the first folio, you see that Hamlet is indeed on the verso page. And what Van Dyck seems to have done, no doubt at Sir John Suckling's behest, is he has moved it to page 153. In other words, he swapped it over like that. Now, I think maybe we've had too much already, but I promise and assure you that I will do a separate programme on the huge significance of 153 as a number that represents Veer as Shakespeare and Veer in his connection to God, as marked out by the sonnets, by the monument at Westminster Abbey and elsewhere. We will come back to 153, but for this programme I'd just like you simply to meditate on the simple idea of Sir John Suckling, who is clearly, I would say, a proto-Mason with his interest in 153, and his wonderful, joyously beautiful picture of standing at the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, asking how does he align himself with his destiny and being told, seek not outside yourself, it is not within you to be influenced except by Veer. So not only a, a wonderful tribute to Shakespeare as the one and only influence worthy of John Suckling, uh, but also obviously explaining that Shakespeare is Edward de Vere. Thank you all very much indeed for watching, and thank you also for the comments that you've been putting down. I have been reading them all. I'm very grateful. I'm very excited by them, particularly the positive ones, but even the negative ones I'm intrigued by, and I will make a better effort in future to respond. Please also press the bell button, subscribe, share this with your friends, and generally bang the drum for the truth that is now pouring out onto the streets of the world. Thank you for watching.